Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, there's been quite a buzz recently about the drug vertiporfin, and that's for good reason, because we've got some juicy new deets about it, so I think it is about time to do another update on this enigmatic yet very promising medication. I've done two previous videos about vertiporfin, and I'll link them below, so be sure to watch them if you haven't yet. So, there's a lot of great hair loss medications that are in the pipeline currently, and they all have tremendous potential. But Despite that, they all have one major limitation. None of them will actually reverse hair loss completely. What I mean by that is that once androgenic alopecia progresses to a certain point, let's say like your Norwood 4 and beyond, then at that point, nothing you could possibly use will ever give you complete hair recovery. Even if you're on the most nuclear hair loss stack imaginable, let's say you're using 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride, a topical anti-androgen like pyrolutamide, and a growth stimulant like minoxidil, even then, the best you could hope for is maintenance and some regrowth. The reason for that is that it does appear that the hair follicles affected by androgenic alopecia do eventually reach a point where the changes are sadly irreversible. Now, maybe there is some possibility of utilizing hair stem cells or hair cloning to get them back from that point, but practically speaking, current treatments under development don't have the power to give someone complete recovery of their lost hair. That is why I always tell you, Chooms, that it is very important to start treatment before losing ground. Of course, you also have the option for a hair transplant, but sadly, even surgical options have severe limitations. Remember, when you get a hair transplant, you're not actually regrowing any new hair. You're just redistributing the hair from one region of the scalp to another in order to make your scalp look more cosmetically presentable. Also, Hair transplant patients are limited by donor hair availability, so if someone needs more than 6,000 grafts, they're usually shit out of luck. Also, some people have variant forms of androgenic alopecia, like retrograde alopecia, where their hair follicles located in what is known as the donor region will actually thin first, which means they effectively have no viable donor hair whatsoever. Now. There are options for patients to have grafts harvested from outside of the scalp, such as extracting hair from facial or body hair, but these options are not ideal. In the case of facial hair, the obvious problem with that is that it will kill your beard. So if beard hair is important to you, then you'll have to make a sacrifice if you elect to have grafts harvested from the face. In the case of body hair transplants, this can look okay in the hands of a really skilled surgeon, and I know there are hair transplant doctors who specialize in this practice, like Dr. Umar in California, but body hair has a different texture than scalp hair, and it also doesn't grow as long, which means you'll have to keep it short. What makes vertiporfin so special, though, is that it is the only hair loss treatment in development right now that has the potential to turn a Norwood 7 into a Norwood 1. How is that possible? Well, it is because vertiporfin has the potential to give patients an unlimited number of grafts. Currently, when someone has a hair transplant, whether it be through the FUT strip method or through an FUE individual hair follicle extraction method, the tissue the hair is extracted from will not regrow any new hair, and in its place will be scar tissue. With vertiporfin, though, the donor region from the follicles are extracted from will actually regrow new hair follicles. So, with the use of vertiporfin in the hands of a skilled surgeon, all it would take is a few surgical procedures to turn a Norwood 7 into a Norwood 1 and not lose any donor hair in the process. We're talking about a complete regrowth of scalp hair. So, how do you like them apples, hair loss witchers? Also, Unlike many of the new treatments I've discussed on my channel, vertiporfin is already an FDA-approved drug. In fact, it was approved way back in 2002. It is sold under the trade name of Visudine, and it is used to treat macular degeneration. But despite being a relatively old drug, there is a lot of active research going on currently with vertiporfin, particularly in the realms of treating cancers like breast cancer, melanoma, and brain tumors. But how would vertiporfin work exactly to provide un limited donor source hair. Well, to better understand this, we have to dig a little bit deeper into what vertiporfin actually does. Fundamentally, vertiporfin has two completely different actions in the body. One action is that when it is injected into the bloodstream, it accumulates in the abnormal blood vessels in the retina that cause macular degeneration. When it is stimulated by a specific frequency of red light, it releases free radicals and destroys those blood vessels. That is why it is used in treating macular degeneration. The other action, which as far as I can 
tell is completely unrelated to the first action is that vertiporfin is an inhibitor of a specific protein called yes associated protein or YAP. This is the action we are most interested in as hair loss switchers. The reason we are interested in YAP is because YAP has to do with the formation of scar tissue in human beings. When we get cut on our skin, we think it's natural that when it heals up, a scar will form, but a scar is not normal skin. It is an area of fibrosis and is mostly made up of collagen. The advantage of having a scar form after an injury is that it is stronger than normal skin and it forms relatively rapidly. The big disadvantage of scar tissue though is that no hair grows in it and it is cosmetically displeasing. This is particularly bad when harvesting hairs from the donor region for a hair transplant. When you have a hair transplant, no matter how careful the surgeon may be, scar tissue will inevitably form in the donor region and the hair won't grow back there. Usually, the donor area is thick enough to hide this fact, but like I said, it really does limit the number of transplants that people can realistically acquire. If the donor region regrew all the hair it lost, you could have a source for unlimited hair transplants. Well, that may sound like it's just a fantasy at this point, because obviously scar tissue is inevitable after a hair transplant, but is that really true? Well, it turns out that the healing mechanism that involves scar tissue is a relatively recent mechanism in terms of evolution. For example, when salamanders lose their legs or a Namekian loses its arms, it will just grow back its leg or its arm. That clearly doesn't happen for humans, but why not? I mean, that would be pretty awesome if it were true, especially for war veterans who lost their limbs. Well. It turns out there are two forms of healing. There's healing by regrowth and healing by forming scar tissue. Like many evolutionary mechanisms, the newer mechanism of healing by forming scar tissue did not eliminate the healing by the regrowth mechanism. It just replaced it. But it turns out the body still remembers the old mechanism, at least on a molecular level. That's why you see medical editors showing off this old black and white picture of a bald guy who had a burn on his scalp, who then healed up and started regrowing hair in the burn region. Somehow, his burn injury managed to heal up by regrowth instead of forming scar tissue, and the regrown skin included hair follicles. Now, what happened to this guy is an outlier. 99% of the time, if someone were to burn their scalp, they get no regrowth and end up with permanent scar tissue. But in extremely rare circumstances, sometimes when people suffer traumatic injury, the tissue will heal back normally, which means even hair follicles that were once present on the tissue will recover. If this were a more common occurrence, then we'd have heard of more case reports about this by now. So even though this type of recovery is exceptionally rare, it does show that our body does remember how to heal by regrowth rather than by forming scar tissue. The problem here is that it almost never happens. The research on healing shows that there are indeed two healing pathways in the body, the scarring pathway and the regenerative pathway. The YAP protein that vertiporfin inhibits is crucial for the scarring pathway to function. Basically, YAP causes the formation of another protein called engrailed 1. This engrailed 1 protein goes on to activate fibroblasts to create fibrosis and scar tissue. So, vertiporfin, it blocks the YAP protein and can potentially switch the body from using the scar healing pathway to the regrowth healing pathway. So people are starting to look at vertiporfin as a drug to help with wound healing. For example, vertiporfin is being looked at to treat large hypertrophic scars that some people get called keloid scars, which are exceptionally ugly and puffy looking scars. But all of this is very new research, just from the last few years or so, and much of it is still animal research. But vertiporfin, it shows a lot of potential. And like I said, it could be used to regrow hair in the donor transplant region, providing an unlimited supply of donor hair. And remember, vertiporfin is already FDA approved, so off-label use would be very easy for doctors to do. It's just a matter of hair transplant surgeons learning how to use it effectively in their patients. And the good news, Chooms, is that it looks like that is finally happening. We're seeing some actual hands-on results and positive outcomes of doctors treating their patients with vertiporfin, and it could be only a short period of time before this practice becomes becomes widespread. Now, of course, we need a lot more research before we can see anything conclusive about vertiporfin. In fact, the only study that I know about using vertiporfin in this way is a study involving one patient. That's right, only one patient. But you gotta start somewhere, right? This study is being done by a hair transplant doctor named Dr. Taleb Berguthi. So, the results of Dr. Berguthi's work have been periodically published on the website Follicle Thought, and there was a recent update on his study from this month. This update is now about a year and a half after the transplant. If you look at the results on his patient, you can see a clear improvement. In this image on the left, you see the treatment area, and on the right is the control area. The treatment dose in this picture was 0.4 milligrams 
milligrams of vertiporfin. It does look like there is a clear improvement, maybe not a 100% recovery, but definitely a recovery of most of the grafts, which is probably good enough. The second picture here is from a different area in the same patient using a lower dose, 0.24 milligrams of vertiporfin, and there is still some recovery, although it is less dramatic than the 0.4 milligram dose. If you look at the close-up photos, the results are more dramatic. For example, here is the 0.4 milligram vertiporfin dose with the treatment area on the left and you have the control area on the right. Clearly you can see areas of greater hair density in the treatment group versus the control group. There appears to be areas of pale looking scar tissue in the control group that are absent from the treatment group. Even with the smaller doses though, you can still see improvement from the treatment group versus the control group, although the differences aren't quite as dramatic. So vertiporfin is clearly a dose dependent drug. Perhaps future trials with higher doses will show even even more, or perhaps they will show even the complete recovery of the hair follicles. At the very least though, this research, even though it is a case report, does seem to confirm the treatment actually works. Mechanistically speaking, the data makes complete sense since we're talking about a treatment that has been shown in animal models to cause regeneration of normal skin and hair follicles. Of course, Having just one subject in a study isn't conclusive by any means. The effect could be overestimated by looking at just one subject, but it could also be underestimated, and this patient could be an example of a poor responder. We don't know yet. We need more data, but what we have so far is very encouraging. I think what we're going to see here are more hair transplant surgeons using this treatment off-label for their patients, and we're likely going to see more success stories just like this. So, it could very well get to the point where vertiporfin has widespread use as an off-label hair loss treatment similar to dutasteride. I doubt it will get submitted for FDA approval, but it probably doesn't need to be. We just need more evidence that it works, and before we know it, every hair transplant surgeon will be using it in their practice. This is very exciting to me because it increases the number of people who will be eligible for hair transplants. Before vertiporfin, someone who had lost too much ground would pretty much be shit out of luck, but now with vertiporfin, it is likely everybody will be able to get all their hair back through surgery. So this is great news here, chums. I should stress though, that that even with vertiporfin being as promising as it is, the best option, the golden option, is to not lose your hair to begin with since there is no guarantee that a hair transplant will look as good as your natural hairline. Also, even though donor hair is resistant to DHT, it is not immune. So even with hair restoration surgery, you should still use finasteride in order to ensure the longevity of your hair follicles. So if you're going to have to use finasteride anyways, you might as well get on it now rather than waiting until you've lost so much ground that you actually need a hair transplant transplant. Nevertheless, I'm happy for this update, and I hope other hair transplant surgeons feel encouraged by this news so they can try it out in their own practice and then report the results to us so that I could share them with you. Anyways, I think that's it for now, so thank you for watching Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.